human endocannabinoid system is really a fascinating physiological system which helps regulate and balance various functions and interactions within the human body. These are tremendously impactful in their scope, affecting things like stress, responses to stress, pain sensitivity, mood, and even memory. The goal of the human endocannabinoid system is to maintain a stable internal environment or homeostasis. I'm Dale Hewitt, founder of New Phase Blends, and today we're going to talk about the human endocannabinoid system and how it works. But before we get started, please click the subscribe and like button below. It helps YouTube show this video to other people who can benefit from the information that I'm about to give you. Given how central the endocannabinoid system, or ECS, is to our basic survival, it's kind of crazy to realize it was only classified as late as 1992. How and why did this occur? So basically a series of experiments across the world involved studying the effects of THC on the brain. The results out of the St. Louis School of Medicine first determined that brains have cannabinoid receptor sites that respond to compounds found in cannabis known as cannabinoids. These receptors, CB1 and CB2, turned out to be the most abundant type of neurotransmitter receptors in the brain, specifically CB1. This research slowed in the United States due to marijuana's status as a controlled substance. The next big discovery was due to the fact that the U.S. was funding research in hopes of detailing negative effects of cannabis consumption. The opposite happened. In 1990, at the National Institute of Mental Health, this came in the form of mapping the DNA sequence of a CB1 receptor, essentially how the body encodes and builds cannabinoid receptors. This was huge. Knowing how to identify the DNA that actually composed the receptors in a genetically modified mouse without this receptor could be created. On a side note, these genetically modified mice are called knockout mice, and their inventors won a Nobel Prize for it in 2007. THC could then be administered to the CB1 deficient knockout mice. Doing so demonstrated that THC had no effect, proving THC works by activating cannabinoid receptors in the brain. A second receptor, CB2, was cataloged shortly after. These sites are found primarily in the immune and peripheral nervous system, which is the nervous system outside of the brain and spinal cord. Endogenous cannabinoid signaling occurs when your body produces its own endocannabinoids. An endogenous cannabinoid is simply a cannabinoid produced within the body, endo within. Discovery of the cannabinoid receptor sites then led to classification of the potential neurotransmitters that fit into the sites, aptly named endocannabinoids. The endo prefix indicates that they are produced within the body. Again, endo within. Two years later, scientists at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem then discovered the two primary, as well as a host of lesser endocannabinoids. Primaries contain AG, and 2-AG. Secondaries contain LEA, DEA, 2-AGE, and NADA. That's following the discovery of the receptor sites and the neurotransmitters that bind with them, the final piece was found to be composed of enzymes. These enzymes break down the neurotransmitters once they complete their actions. With this, the human endocannabinoid system was officially mapped and catalog. This is a brief rundown, but this is basically what happened. We now know, without a doubt, that we have an efficient cannabinoid signaling system within our bodies. As we mentioned, this system is composed of three parts. Cannabinoid receptor sites spread in a wide pattern across the body, primarily in the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Here's an interesting fact. According to expert opinion on drug discovery, fatty acid amide hydrolase, FAAH, is an internal membrane enzyme that hydro hydrolyzes the endocannabinoid and related signaling lipids. 
They even go on to claim that the FAAH shows potential for treating pain and central nervous system disorders. A brief biology refresher may be useful here. I know I needed it. Messages are carried through your brain via neurons. These messages move across pathways called synapses. Most synapses are chemical in nature, meaning that information is carried by chemical messengers to the next neuron. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers related by neurons, excuse me, they are released by neurons at synapses. This enables messages to move to neighboring cells. Finally, the cannabinoid receptor proteins let the next cell understand the message being sent. Some neurotransmitters are excitatory, meaning the neuron is more likely to fire a message, thus increasing the effect. This is also known as neuronal excitability. Others are generally inhibitory, making the target neuron less likely to fire a message, thus diminishing its effect. As an example, CBD reduces inflammation and pain, right? It has an inhibitory effect on the chemical messages for swelling being sent through your brain due to an injury. Enzymes speed up or catalyze chemical reactions. They can be immensely powerful, accelerating a chemical reaction by a factor of over one million. Our bodies rely on enzymes to carry out chemical reactions that keep us alive. In our digestive system, enzymes help the body break down larger complex molecules into smaller molecules, enabling the body to use them as fuel. Enzymes in the liver break down toxins. As it pertains to the human ECS, enzymes are responsible for breaking down endocannabinoids once they've carried out their function. The human ECS is a modulatory system, meaning that it regulates neurons. This is why the primary function of the ECS is thought to be maintaining a homeostasis. It appears to play a very important regulatory role in hormones related to appetite, immune function, pain, metabolism, stress responses, anxiety, mood, fertility, pregnancy, you get the idea. A whole bunch of different stuff. Since we know the ECS helps to regulate homeostasis, it makes total sense that endogenous cannabinoids are released as needed. This release activates more cannabinoid receptor sites, which are then ready to receive more endogenous cannabinoids. It's all part of a comprehensive system that communicates with itself in order to make the ship correct, so to speak. The ship's our body. CB1 receptors are almost exclusively found in the central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord. It controls most functions of the body and the mind. Endocannabinoid signaling can occur when CB1 and or CB2 cannabinoid receptors are stimulated. CB1 activation results in rapid suppression of neurotransmitter release into synapses. In effect, reducing signals, typically. CB2 receptors are mostly located in immune cells and when activated, can modulate the immune cells functioning. This modulation, almost like tuning an instrument, helps the body respond to cell damage and to heal. THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol, is one of many exogenous cannabinoids found within cannabis, specifically, well, mostly marijuana. This is the compound that gets people high. Why is this? It happens because of organic chemistry. THC fits really well into both CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. This is known as a strong binding affinity. This binding allows it to send strong messages throughout the brain and body. This is the reason why THC, which is a uh, excuse me, phytocannabinoid, which means plant chemical, produces feelings of euphoria. It basically mimics AEA, an endocannabinoid produced in the body and fits perfectly in the receptor site for that neurotransmitter. This fit allows for chemical signals to proceed across the synapse. AEA targets some of the pleasure and reward centers in the pathways of the brain. This results in the high that we get from THC. It's almost like human ECS systems were designed to interact with cannabis. 
THC has been shown to possess therapeutic potentials in the treatment of nausea, weight loss, pain, muscle spasms, and a lot of other things. The other major cannabinoid found in cannabis is CBD, which a lot of you have heard of. It's found in both hemp and marijuana. CBD is typically extracted from hemp, though, because marijuana-derived CBD has far more legal restrictions on it. Unlike THC, CBD is not psychoactive, which means it won't get you high. It also typically doesn't cause severe negative side effects either. Things like drowsiness, maybe dry mouth, are more commonly observed. Scientists are still unsure of how CBD interacts with the ECS, though. We do know it does not bind to CB1 or CB2 receptors the same way THC does. There's some indication it can fit into the sites, but the exact way it does so is unknown. One of the possibilities is that it works by preventing endocannabinoids from being broken down. This allows them to have more profound effect on your body, since the neurons sending these signals do so more intensely. Another possibility is that CBD binds to an unknown receptor. Evidence suggests additional cannabinoid receptors exist, we just haven't identified them yet at a molecular level. This also might explain why people don't seem to build up a tolerance to CBD like they do with THC. Our bodies produce and send neurotransmitters in response to many biological factors. This production leads to different biological processes, which makes sense. For example, when we are hungry and presented with food, circulating AEA levels increase stimulating appetite and food intake. That's why THC is used to treat eating disorders. It makes you eat a lot. The levels of endocannabinoids in our body increase in response to positive stimulus such as exercise and even forms of social interactions. It's been shown that moderate intensity exercise can significantly increase circulating endocannabinoid levels. Healthy cyclists, for example, following a 90 minute exercise period, we have a positive correlation here, which was observed between this and circulating AEA. This data suggests that, at least in part, the effect of exercise on cognitive function and mood could be modulated by our ECS. As a side note, CBD can be used for energy. In low doses, it has stimulant-like effects. This is much more beneficial than compounds like caffeine because there's no crash associated after use. We even developed a product called Go that takes advantage of this. The function of endocannabinoid uh, signaling during stress is to insulate the stress response and reduce negative emotions. Exposure to acute stress induces changes in the uh, endocannabinoid levels. For example, reducing AEA levels leads to the activation of other stress hormones. In contrast, an increase in 2-AG levels in response to stress contributes to the suppression of the hormones. However, impairment in the ECS as a result of chronic stress may cause stress-related behaviors like anxiety and depression. Another physiological condition the human endocannabinoid system helps regulate is inflammation. An increase in latent endocannabinoid concentrations has been observed in patients with cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis C infections, uh, even some heart failures. Endocannabinoids are extensively involved in regulating the immune response by activating CB2 receptors. CB2 receptor activation is associated with a reduction, what is known as pro-inflammatory cytokine release. As the name suggests, chemical signals called cytokines send messages to produce inflammation. Reducing this signaling may function to actually reduce inflammation. As we just mentioned, Impairment of the ECS can lead to a variety of pretty debilitating conditions. This deficiency causes our baseline homeostasis to become out of whack with too much or too little ECS activity. This imbalance is a reflection of endocannabinoid levels in the brain and body, how they're produced, broken down, and availability of CB receptors. 
These can be associated with various disorders. Let's take a closer look at some possible outcomes here. Too little endocannabinoid system activity has been linked to contribute to a number of conditions like chronic pain, psychiatric disorders, and other mental states. Some of these might include migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, and even fibromyalgia. Post-traumatic stress disorder is another commonly known condition that the ECS seems to affect in one way or another. The levels of cannabinoid 2-AG in victims of PTSD have been observed to be significantly lower than those without PTSD. This suggests a casual link, at a minimum, between the inability of the body to reset a healthy endocannabinoid level and maintain homeostasis after a traumatic event for some individuals. The phytocannabinoids, plant chemicals, contained in cannabis can be used to supplement the deficiency. By stimulating and supporting your endocannabinoid system, one can find relief from a multitude of illnesses and conditions. The opposing swing in human ECS towards hyperactivity seems just as harmful. An overactive system is associated with conditions like obesity, metabolic syndrome, and cancer development. But why? So chronic overeating and fat accumulation overheat the ECS, producing an overabundance of neurotransmitters and their receptor sites. This, in turn, promotes even more obesity by stimulating appetite and more efficient enzymatic breakdown of the food cons consumed. An overstimulation of our ECS has direct effects on insulin sensitivity and glucose metabolism. Tissues like the liver and skeletal muscle are affected by this. As we know, personal decisions are some of the cornerstones of a healthy lifestyle. Our bodies basically exist in feedback loops that can aggravate or mitigate the way we treat our bodies. Let's review some strategies to keep the ECS in prime operating condition. The following have all been shown in clinical studies to promote a healthy and balanced endocannabinoid system. Maintain moderate body weight, engage in, ex in regular exercise, follow a healthy diet with an emphasis on healthy fats like olive oil, fish, seeds, and nuts, eating organic food when possible and limiting exposure to foods that will disrupt your enzyme production. Control or eliminate exposure of carcinogens like cigarette smoke, alcohol, and drugs. Stress management. Phytocannabinoid administration with CBD produces a healthy cannabinoid level. Our bodies produce, send, and utilize cannabinoids in ways that have profound effects on our bodies. They do so to mitigate all sorts of environmental stress. This is how homeostatic balance is maintained in the body. Given the critical importance in nature of the human endocannabinoid system, it's no surprise that an increasing number of products are coming down the pipe that have been identified as ways to support this awesome system that we have. Along with evidence-based lifestyle decisions, targeted nutritional products like CBD and therapies including phytocannabinoids and endocannabinoid-like compounds, you can support your endocannabinoid system and promote your overall health. If you found this video beneficial or interesting, please subscribe by clicking the subscribe and like button below. It helps YouTube show this video to other people who can benefit from the information that it has in it.